the We Grow Our Show with your hosts, Nick Klein and Don Cupper. We discuss everything from politics to planting. Live food storage is our passion, and we want to share our passion with you. We cover techniques, methods, and tips to not only survive, but thrive. Join us at WeGrowOurs.com and get your grow on. This week on We Grow Ours, we will be interviewing Scott Yarish of the Yarish Homestead. He's a man that does 50 acres worth of work in less than, what, half an acre on his property? Yeah, it's he's got no space, and he's got this whole little homestead with aquaponics and quail. And In fact, I, I'll see if I can get a couple pictures of his aquaponics system and maybe some of his setups. He does rabbits. He's going to be teaching at the homesteading conference April 5th and 6th in Chandler. So if you want to meet him, come out there and take a look at that. Yeah, in his, I've been to his house and it is the ideal functioning backyard homestead. It, in an HOA. Oh yeah. The it, homeowners association for those who don't live around here. His neighbors love him because he, he's got great relationships with his neighbors on both sides. Uh, they're getting, they're getting free or cheap food that's raised healthily and, and responsibly. Yeah. So it, it's really awesome what he's doing. We'll have some pictures up and, uh, we'll have a link to his, to his website as well. Yeah, his Facebook page. Uh, we're also going to talk about prepping a little bit. Nick and I want to discuss with you guys kind of our thoughts about preppers. Uh, preppers are our core. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at We Grow Ours. You can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash We Grow Ours. On the website, We Grow Ours.com. We have a spot in there where you can ask us. Guys, go use that. Uh, record your voices in there if you want. We've got a little link. You can go record your question. We'll feature you on the show. Preppers are a big part of our core. So we want to talk a bit about our prepping style. Uh, Nick has some thoughts a little different than I do. We, I don't think either of us are doomsday preppers and I don't think either of us really like the doomsday prepper show in some aspects of it. We, we love doomsday preppers and we love some of the people that they have on there. Some of them we're not so fond of, but that's why we want to discuss prepping. We want to get your opinion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, that's, I started into uh, – when I first went public with hostile hair, my first thought was I need to get this in the hands of everybody who's ever thought that food storage was a good idea. Right. Because food storage is great, but living out of a can for months at a time, I'm sorry, but I, I need something fresh. I need something good. And We talked on episode one about you know, I think having – let's just talk about prepping now and then we'll, we'll get Scott on and, and have the interview. So – Six months of food storage is a wonderful idea. I think you need cans and all. And mm -hmm. if you don't have an urban farm, I think getting set up to at least do some live food storage is a great idea, whether it be one rabbit, one female, one male. Mm -hmm. Have them around. They're not that expensive, even if you don't breed them. Keep yeah. them around. They make they make good pets. They cost you $30 per adult rabbit per year to feed them. And that's nothing. And that's that's just off of store-bought feed. That's right. And if you had a fodder kit. Or um, insects. Or insects. Well, not for rabbits, but. Oh, good point. Yeah, rabbits are not carnivorous. Unless you saw that last Johnny Depp film where the rabbits were eating scorpions, but you know, whatever. Uh. Or Monty Python. <laughs> or Monty Python. <laughs> Go to the classic. Oh, is it behind the rabbit? <laughs> oh, I'm not gosh. dead, really. I'm not. Okay, stop it. I right. love that show. <laughs> All right, so. The, the point is you could have a rabbit around or, or three of them and it'll cost you less than a hundred bucks a year. Now fodder, if you are sprouting and growing food for the rabbits, you can get that price down much further to where it's less than ten dollars a year per animal. So that's much more economic, economical and, uh, there's a little bit more work involved in it, but not a whole lot, not enough to shake a stick at. I just got a 50 pound bag of barley. Uh huh. So what did that run you anyway? Uh, I think it was it's non-GMO, hundred percent organic. There's a co-op down here that that we belong to, oh. and every two months we order our quail food, which we we get the turkey starter, mm -hmm. and we get all of our chicken food and some of our goat food. And I picked up that bag. I think it was like fifteen, sixteen bucks for a fifty-pound really? bag of it. And that's uh, I haven't even opened it yet. So um, you can buy. Organic barley for fifteen, sixteen bucks a bag. I can put a can link buy... to it and and give you an actual quote because I honestly we combined it with everything, so oh, I don't okay. know what the total on it was. I yeah, don't think it was that. over twenty, even if it's thirty. I, I, I'm sure it wasn't over thirty. I'll put the link up so we can take a look at it. Perfect, because I know that organic organic rabbit feed 
in and of itself is like th- almost 30 bucks for a 50 pound bag. Some places you can get 25 pound box and it'll cost you another 20 bucks in shipping to get it to you. And it's ridiculously expensive. And if you're growing it your own from the seed, that's the way to go. Honestly, that's the best way to, to really control what's going into what you're eventually going to eat. I don't know if I, I I'm a prepper, but I'm also an urban farmer. Mm hmm. Uh, we moved out. I started doing aquaponics in an HOA. We moved out a little bit. So we've got an acre and a quarter. We've got goats. We've got chickens. We've got quails. We've got aquaponics. I did that for a lifestyle change to get my kids more into it. And we had some problems with our homeowners association that I, I don't even want to go into. I just didn't like the environment any longer. I loved my neighbors. They Hate's were great. a strong word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's exactly appropriate. So. <laughs> I'm I'm an urban farmer. We're homeschooling and we're preppers. I'm not prepping for a nuclear blast. If it happens, then, you know, uh, let it get me on the first strike. Yeah. I, I don't Hope know. Hope it hits I, somewhere <laughs> close. Yeah. A, a meteor coming down. I uh, applaud the people that prep for those. It's just not who I am. Mm. We're, we have a little bit different of a reason. You know, I think we mentioned on episode one about I like to prep in case I lose a job, in case I get injured. I like to be able to have the food there. I am working. This is kind of cool, Nick. I don't know if I've told you. I've got a little five by eight trailer. Uh-huh. I'm working on designing a cage system for a rabbit quail to put my goat in, to put some aquaponics in there. So if we did need to, we're looking at some property up north. If we did need to actually go, I could take enough with us and a little Noah's Ark type thing. You know, take <laughs> enough with us to actually start our urban farm somewhere else. So I am a prepper. Noah's trailer. Noah's trailer, yeah. <laughs> Live food storage trailer, Gosh. you know. If that, I thought I was the redneck in this group, man. That sounds, oh. I, I, you know, I've I could got, just see pulling I've, that with a Prius, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which oh. I do not drive, by the way. Oh my goodness. That's funny. And see, I, you know, I, I'm with you on that one. I'm not, uh, I think if there's something catastrophic enough to wipe out life on the earth, on the face of the planet, yeah, I, I don't want to live in a bunker until I die and try to raise kids in that. I just think, all right, if this is the end of the earth, Lord, <laughs> get it done, you know? Yeah. But, uh. A zombie I, apocalypse, on the other hand, that would be fun, you know? <laughs> I have a reason for all those millions of rounds of ammunition. I exactly. Got. So, you know, something like that. What about a pandemic? That's been in the news a lot. Pandemic, uh, you know, with uh, international travel becoming more and more, well, it, it's happening. There, it's being used much more. There's people going to China one day and they're back in the in the U.S. the next day. It's not that just China has diseases, but that exposes that brings bacterial exposure much closer to home. Yeah, much quicker than uh-huh. it ever did before. And you know, it's it's kind of like when you go to another country, they say, don't drink the water. Well, you see the locals, they're drinking it. They're used to those pathogens. They're used to the stuff that's in the water, and yep. they can handle it. Their immune systems are built for it. Little white boy going to Mexico, you're going to have Montezuma's revenge real quick. You start drinking the water. So so what? It, it, go to your house. What is it that you prep for? What are the emergencies? That, how long do you have? What do you, what do you, What's your thoughts on this? Gold, silver, too. Gold is huge. Silver is huge to me. Yeah, but you can't eat it. I agree. See, I, I agree that gold holds its value. Silver holds its value. The dollar and the government issued currencies fluctuate because of the trust of the people and they're not backed by anything. We won't get into that right now. But honestly, what got me thinking that I needed to prepare for a rainy day was I walked into work and there was another guy working what I was supposed to be doing, and I got the hint real quick that I was getting replaced. Luckily enough, he turned out to be an idiot. I didn't have to go looking for a job, but then my boss was going to replace me. He flat out told me, hey, that's your replacement in there. But uh anyway, when that happened, it really sent a shiver up my spine, and it's like, okay, I know I can pay my house with this much cash. I have this much saved up. I can do this and this and this and this and this. I did the math out. I was like, great. I should be fine for like three months until I get another job. Well, I didn't consider uh, my uh, number one bad habit, which is eating too much uh, into that equation. So I hadn't, I had not prepared mentally for uh, what what I would do for food? Beans and rice, rice and beans. Oh yeah, beans, rice, rice and beans. I for those that don't know, I, I lived in Mexico for a while, and uh, if I eat, uh, if if I never eat. 
beans and rice again. It'll be a day too soon. I, not a fan. Anyway, but that's what stores well. And so that was the first thing that my wife suggested that we get food storage. Well, I'm looking at rice and beans and like, well, I'm just going to stock up on enough bullets to end me because that's what it's going to be. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was, uh, it, I, I realized that if I really did have to live out of my food storage, I probably wouldn't do so hot because I don't, I didn't enjoy what we had, we had in cans. I'm like, I need meat. I need this. I need that. And being a farm boy, you know, from backwoods of Wisconsin, that's, uh, I had skills in animal husbandry that, that I needed to put into effect. Well, you, I lived in an H, I live in an HOA. Uh, homeowners association and you can't have a Holstein in your backyard or an Angus steer. The neighborhood would kind of frown on that. Yep. You can have rabbits. Well, on the books, I don't think you're supposed to, but since they don't really make any noise or smell, I was able to get away with having a few. A few. Yeah. Well, I started with five. <laughs> about, about four months after I got started, I, I ended up with about 15 breeders and I'm just producing Oh, 60 rabbits a month, somewhere around there. And then pretty soon, uh, I got up to 50 breeders and was producing 250 rabbits a month. Now uh, you had your meat storage. I, oh, well, I had, I had that with two rabbits. Right, right. That's the thing. So I had the 250 rabbits I was producing a month. I built the cages in the backyard and, and, uh, got it all organized. It was working pretty good. And then I wanted to expand further. And that's when my wife put her foot down and said, uh, uh-uh. uh. We got to get you somewhere else. That's right, not here. <laughs> so, so what else prepping do you? I know you do the rabbits. Mm-hmm. What else do you do? What do you? Well, I like you said. I'm more concerned about what could happen to me economically. Uh, what could happen uh, if that proverbial rainy day comes and all of a sudden people don't need me to do what I do for work? Yeah, I, I'm personally concerned about a financial collapse. I think that's pretty high up there for us. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that could always happen. It's happened to countries constantly. You look at, you get one guy in office that decides to print a ton of money and all of a sudden the money that you have isn't worth anything. Yeah. That's not happening today, is it? Oh, I don't know. So <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, by the way. Yes, we know it's happening, uh, to the tune of the trillions of dollars. And, and I don't want to get into the end, the Fed thing, but, uh-huh. um, as we go through the prepping, are you a community prepper or are you, do you prepare for yourself? Do you prepare to feed your community? Do you plan to open your doors? Are you planning to be a marauder? What is kind of your thoughts on that whole thing? Well, I don't move fast enough to be a marauder and I'm not that good a shot. So I figure preppers can be categorized into two classes and from there there's off, there's offshoots, but you've got your bug out guys and your dig in guys. Some people call it bugging in, which doesn't make sense to me. I'd say digging in like you're digging in the trench. Right. I'm more of a stay put, wait it out, grow what you can and what you can control. And I have oh, I, my my family and close friends know what I do, and they kind of have assignments that if we needed to get together, this is what they would do. So, yeah, I would say I'm more of a community prepper. One of the things that uh, I pride myself on is I could feed an army if we needed to. Uh, just out of a 500 square foot building, I'd be able to produce 3,500 pounds of rabbit per day or per month. Right. So yeah, per day, that'd be pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, I could produce that much, which would feed a lot of hundreds people. of people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've that got was- a, I've got a sister who lives close by my brother-in-law and sister. Mm-hmm. My brother-in-law would be the guy with, he wants, to, he saves the gold. Um, they've got a good foods, you know, stash, but they're the, and they've now got an aquaponic system too. Uh, so, so they're moving in that direction. They'll be, ha- they'll have chickens here shortly. Mm-hmm. I want to be the one to grow the food. We'll work together on the gold. We'll work together on the guns. We'll work together to do that. I'm also preparing. I'd like to be prepared to bug out. Um, yeah. I live pretty far out of the valley as it is pretty far north, but I'd love to get further out. And, yeah. and I'd love to have the ability, but we talk about prepping. One of the things is I, I'm a very budget prepper. We had some financial situations that we don't want to be back in. Mm. I don't know if you ever heard of Dave Ramsey. Yeah. You know, the debt snowball. We're working our prep right now is we're hoping that things hold out for another two, three, four years so we can get debt free. So it's hard to spend money 
on prepping when we're trying to spend money on paying off of all of our bills, when yeah. we're trying to get debt free so we're not in debt to anyone. And that's one of our main preps right now. My wife is in a getting into minimalized living. She's starting a blog on minimalized living and kind of our story going through this. So that's one of the things that – that to me is prepping. It's preparing, preparing for the future. Well, and and let's define this term prepping. This is relatively new because not too many years ago, there was no such thing as prepping. It was just called being prepared because, hey, winter's coming and we don't have a refrigerator. That Good my, point. My heritage uh, is – you know, in Wisconsin, like I was saying, but you go back three generations and it was pretty humble. You know, these, these guys were going through the Great Depression and, and, and even the good years prior to that, when there's six foot of snow on the ground, there ain't nothing growing. Yeah. And you have to prepare for that. So prepping is not a new idea. It's something that's been revamped because people realize that, hey, we are very dependent on a very fragile food supply. Right. They say grocery stores, cities, three days. Three days and that's without will be looting. gone. That's without looting. Yeah. I mean, you, you get into you know, martial law, something like that, a, a breakdown of the water supply, a breakdown of the sewer system, electricity, mm -hmm. could be anything. And, and that could be caused by natural or man-made things. I mean, th and yeah. that's what we're looking at. Okay. Do we have enough fuel to run the generator, keep the refrigerator going in, the, in, in Arizona, the air conditioning going in the summertime for at least a few hours a day? Yeah. And run the aquaponic system and solar to help supplement that. So again, trying to do that on a budget. I think budget prepping is, is really difficult, and, but at the same time, really important. And I think you've got it right. You're, we're not, this isn't new. We're trying to move backward. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 uh, what's great is technology is awesome. It's a, it's a great thing. We've become a little bit dependent on it. We are, in a society where if something goes down, there's not an analog backup. Everything is digital and we're just, we're just like, Oh, we wake, we wake up and we don't even wear watches. You know, my generation, they're not a watch wearing group. Yeah. It's, we've got a cell phone. Oh, I need to talk to mom quick. You know, we got a text going over, but in some places back in Wisconsin, uh, there's folks that are riding around that have CB radios in their truck, ham radios in their truck, and it's a little bit illegal, but we don't really care, uh, marine radios because they cover a lot further distance. Yeah. So uh, that's not a suggestion for We Grow Hours, but it is one of those things that works. Is uh, now, I've got a range. little ham radio. Ham uh, radio? We can transmit. Mm -hmm. We don't um, because we're not supposed to. But I guess in an emergency situation, I certainly would. I bought it because I was in a, a Jeep club, mm -hmm. the Arizona Virtual Jeep Club, and we'd go out on these long trails and one person in the front, one person in the back, you know, we kind of that rubber band effect. So we needed somebody with a ham radio. A lot of times, if even if I was stuck in the middle, I wanted to know what was going on and a CB wouldn't do it out here in the mountains. Oh, no, you you're, you have to be in line of sight. Right. For the CB to work or at least on flat surface. So something like that, it's a... $90. Mm -hmm. I mean, for an inexpensive ham radio, so you can listen. That's a great prep. Batteries stuck in your freezer. A lot of people freeze them, mm -hmm. you know, so you have something on a backup. If the cell phone goes down, you know, people don't even have, I don't have a home phone. I, all I have yeah, is a cell phone. Either. So it's, it's getting back and, and just taking a quick look at what do you have and can you get by three days, seven days, 15, you know, what, where is that number that you feel that you should have? And that number may change for everybody. Uh, originally, I wanted three months. That was, that was really my goal is I want three months of food, water, money. I want to live three months without any, anybody, any outside help. I'd like to push that further. But once we hit that three month mark, we're saying, okay, we're, we're fairly happy here. Now it's time to go back and get that debt paid off. Okay. So where are you? What what's your month? Are you five days? <laughs> no, I well, I I would have a hard time really counting out. Because, well, let's see. On my property in the HOA, I have fifteen breeding female rabbits, which is overkill for me and my wife. Right. So right. That's protein, barter, though. Yeah, protein is pretty much taken care of. Uh, I have. 
a six month supply of different grains that can be made into flour and, and I have all of those types of, of canned goods. And then we have a lot of, uh, canned soups and stuff in the, in the pantry. Medical supplies? Well, that's the other thing that we'll get into here one of the next episodes, but my, uh, my uncle is actually a podiatrist and, and he came to me with a, with a bug out bag that was full of medical supplies. And he's like, look, we could do this, 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 and this, because these are all the things that, I mean, you don't think about it. You, you fall down and hit a tree branch or something, and it sticks into your arm. Well, a doctor would put you on a course of, of antibiotics. Right. What are you going to do without antibiotics out in the woods? Well, you want to have enough stored up so that you could have them. Now that's a big gotcha out in the woods is uh, infection. Yeah, a lot of people die of exposure instead of, you know, the, the, the war wounds of, of olden days, they would die from the infections and that's why they'd have to amputate and then sear the wound. Yeah, I don't want to be there. No, no. It's just a, you talk about going back in time. <laughs> oh man, I'm going to bring my technology with me. My uncle said, well, you know, you keep enough, keep enough antibiotics on you so you can survive until you can produce your own antibiotics. And people don't realize this, but hey, they have to come from somewhere. How do you make antibiotics? I have no idea. Well, penicillin is a type of mold. Yeah, fact, penicillin. The first time that there's a reference to penicillin being used, it wasn't it wasn't the doctor, but uh, back in history, uh, Richard the Lionheart, while he was on the Crusades, one of the they call them the Moors, the, a Moor doctor gave him a rotten orange and put it right on the wound. That is what healed him. Well, and, and that's something I don't know about antibiotics and, and the medical end of it. But again, my wife is luckily, we're, we're both lucky because we have very supportive spouses. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to this, my wife is into the natural remedies. What herbs can we use? What can we grow in our system? What can we do? So, you know, we have things growing that I, I don't know what they are, but you know, she <laughs> says, Hey, this is something we can make tea out of. It treats migraines. It treats infections. Um, honey is a great antibiotic. Uh, you can put it on, on wounds and it never spoils. So we're looking at, you know, increasing our stock of honey. In fact, we're looking for people to barter our rabbit meat, our, our tilapia, our vegetables. We want to barter that out and say, okay, well, I'll give you a couple pounds of tomatoes. Can I get some honey? And, and I want to go non GMO. I, I want to get away from Monsanto. Uh, Scott Yarish is going to talk about the reason he is non GMO and one of the reasons he does this. I'm, I'm kind of along the same lines with that too. Yeah. Well, that's pretty funny. I, I don't know if I'd be able to put honey on my wounds because I'd be too tempted to lick them. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprising. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and introduce Scott? All right, Scott Yarish is with us today. He is a seasoned veteran in the quail raising world. Uh, he has turned his little backyard into a massive meat producer. I've been back there and I have to say I'm jealous. He's absolutely, he's maximized his space. Uh, it looks good. It's functioning. It's incognito. His animals are happy. Yep. And he's been able to do this all organically. So, and, and the reason we know Scott is both of us get our quail from Scott. That's right. I'm, so he's our supplier. I'm one of his consumers. Absolutely. Well, today we've got Scott Yarish with us, and he is the owner of the Yarish Homestead, a large stretch of land that's uh, how many acres, Scott? It's one, one, one eleventh of an acre. Oh man, that's just, that's rolling in the acreage right there. So how is it possible to feed a family off of such a small amount of space? What's your, what's your keystone, uh, livestock? Well, uh, the Yarsh Homestead got started with quail and it is our backbone livestock. Uh, the main reason we chose quails because it doesn't require a lot of space. It's HOA friendly and they produce eggs very, very quickly. And very regularly. That's cool. How many uh, how many quail eggs can you get per year? Each female quail will give you approximately 300 eggs a year once she starts laying, and she'll start laying in about seven uh, seven weeks. So it's seven weeks from the time she hatches, she's already ready to start producing eggs. That's it. Um, really, really, really fast producers. You don't have to wait months and months and months like you do with other poultry. Their eggs for their body size. Is is huge, you know. If a if a chicken laid a uh, same egg 
proportional. It would be about the size of a softball. Holy cow, that'd be a big old egg. Be that kind, would. It'd be kind of fun to watch a chicken try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy watching the quail do it. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they're fairly small animals. Um, you know, an average uh, quail that you raise in your backyard is going to be about nine ounces live weight. Um, they can get up as much as 15 ounces, uh, but that's uh, pretty rare. And you have to you have to work really hard in selective breeding to get your quail up that big. Yeah, but even even at nine ounces, that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty stout bird. How's the meat to live weight ratio? How many how many uh, ounces can you get out of a quail that's ready to butcher? We'll take a uh, a full mature, fully mature quail. Once again, that's about nine ounces. We'll dress it out, and it'll be about six and a half ounces, give or take, depending on the uh, the sex of the quail and the feathers, the tummy, that sort of thing. But you'll get about six and a half ounces out of a nine ounce quail. Um, and of that six, six and a half ounces, at least five ounces of that is edible. So there's a, there's quite a bit of meat on a little quail. So speaking of the meat, what, uh, what do you, what would you compare the, the taste of the quail meat? Is it, is it just like chicken or how would you describe it? Well, the quail I raise are, uh, Katornix quail and they are a dark meat varietal of quail. So the taste is going to be a little bit more like a really good free range turkey than it would be, uh, chicken. But you can use it interchangeably with, uh, pretty much any of your chicken recipes. Nice. All right. So, how much uh, how much space would you need to to raise some quail? Like, what's a good setup? Where do you where do you get started? Well, once again, quail don't require a lot of space, which is why it's so great for urban homesteaders. You can start raising quail in as little as you know a square foot of space, that upside of a shoebox. That's what each live weight, full grown, mature quail with a would really like is an ideal situation is about a shoebox size of space. So you can have a lot of quail in a really small space. That's awesome. So that's uh, that's what's great about them is with the proper cages, you could also go vertical with that and really uh, really maximize the, the small acreage that you have, the small amount of space. So what inspired you to uh, to get into quail? Let's hear a little bit about you. Yeah, how did you get into homesteading, and how did you discover quail in the first place, Scott? Well, we discovered quail because we wanted to raise chickens, and our HOA and our city zoning do not allow us to raise chickens in our backyard. So uh, we looked for alternatives in order to get fresh eggs every day. Doing some research, we found out that quail in our city and our HOA were considered pets, not poultry or livestock. So we figured, hey, let's go ahead and try this out. Once we started, we got up. Nice. So you're addicted to quail now. Is that what you're saying? I am absolutely addicted to quail. I currently have uh, approximately 250 to 300 quail right now in my house. So, you know, everywhere from newborn hatchlings all the way up to uh, birds that are about a year old that have been producing for me for quite a while. How long do uh, quail produce the eggs? How, what's their life cycle and laying? I mean, you said they lay about 360 eggs a year, which is just amazing. What's kind of that, that life cycle? How long will they do that? How long will they last? They'll lay the maximum number of eggs in the first uh, two years of their life. Uh, they'll continue laying for three years total, but the first two years is their maximum production of uh, of eggs. It will slowly dwindle after that, and they will live for up to five years. But your primary egg laying time frame is, is the first two years of their life. I know you harvest the quail mostly for meat uh, as well as, as collecting their eggs, as far as the meat taste, is it different between, let's say, a six-week-old or six-month-old or one-year or three-year quail? Well, uh, my personal opinion, and once again, everyone has an opinion on this, uh, my personal opinion is the quail tastes better the older it is. Really? Um, the older, Yeah, the oldest quail I've ever eaten is about a two-and-a-half-year-old quail. And the nice thing about the older quail is uh, even though they quit growing at about, oh, right around five to seven weeks, they quit growing in size, they start packing on a nice layer of fat. 
and quell mm-hmm. fat is really tasty. Yeah, does it, you can get it to render completely into the into the meat, right? Oh, definitely, definitely, and then you'll get a little bit of I'm gonna call it marbling, but it's not really marbling because you know poultry doesn't exactly marble. Uh-huh. But um, the older that the quell gets, the more of this uh, this fat interlacing in with the muscle that you get, it makes the bird, in my opinion, a lot more flavorful. Yeah, and I I actually uh, that that brings me. Uh, it reminds me of something I've been researching. Apparently, uh, the whole idea of fats being a bad thing is hogwash. You know, we 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 became a society where uh, everything had to be fat free, but it tasted gross, so they started adding carbohydrates to it and, and sugar and sugar. Well, that's yeah, basically just all of this carbs that you're eating constantly uh, shuts down your ability to absorb or not absorb, but to use the fat in your bloodstream. So uh, people are, that are hearing about all the fat and stuff that we're talking about, this is good, healthy fat. And, Scott, if I'm not mistaken, you're raising your quail non-GMO, correct? That is correct. One of the reasons why we wanted to get into raising our own eggs and meat uh, was because of the worry about genetically modified foods. My family and I didn't want to be guinea pigs again. And the reason why I say again is because when I was 15, I was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer. And the only known cause of this particular bone cancer is a chemical that's found in a defoliant made by Monsanto. That was well, we love those the- guys. We do. We love Monsanto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this defoliant was used during uh, the Vietnam conflict, and it was told to the soldiers that it was perfectly safe. And that they could drink it. That's how safe it was. Well, uh, we're now finding out that uh, it affects your DNA and your genes. And it, parents can pass it on to their kids. And that's how I uh, became infected, I guess you'd say. But <laughs> that's, that's how it affected me. I, my father was in Vietnam. My bone cancer was caused from his exposure to it. Since then, I have... A very little trust in anything that Monsanto says. Well, I, I mean, I hate to say it, not just Monsanto in this case. It sounds like the government need to, made some mistakes here as well. I know both Nick and I don't like Monsanto. Yeah. So, Scott, tell tell me about what your opinions of GMO are then. I mean, I know you're doing this to so you don't have to eat the GMO food, the genetically modified what are your thoughts about this whole GMO thing? I saw in the news just yesterday, the day before, that Monsanto is now getting into GMO wheat. They've got the corn. You know, they're doing bees. I've been doing a lot of research on bees, and, and Monsanto owns patents on bee genomes. So what are your thoughts about this whole thing and, and where we're headed? Well, um, just real generically and, and right off the cuff, I believe that you don't really mess with Mother, mother Nature. And you shouldn't take a jellyfish and shove it into a piece of corn just because you'll be able to cover that corn with poison and it won't die. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's my number one concern right there. My number two concern, and it pretty much outweighs my number one concern, is that there is zero testing on GMO. A matter of fact, according to the patent that Monsanto has on the GMOs, it is illegal for any third party company to do any testing on genetically modified foods that Monsanto has patents on without Monsanto's permission. And they have never given permission to anyone. Right. So quail is your solution. Quail is my solution. Now, you know, you do want a variety of foods. So I turn to people like uh, like Nick there and get rabbits from him, which is another awesome form of of meat. Uh, tilapia from aquaponics, which... Uh, You know, I understand that, Don, you've got a hand in on that. Um, And then there's a huge community out in the uh, the Valley of the Sun, and I'm sure just about anywhere, where uh, you have backyard farmers that are producing food for themselves, and they usually have an excess of what they're producing because it is not much harder to produce 10 chickens instead of just two chickens. So, you know, there's a huge network out there that you can actually reach out to Get food from them. You might have to do a little work in processing it, but uh, 
that's that's nothing to know that your food is coming directly from someone who cares about that animal, that the animal was put down very humanely, and that the animal was fed the best possible product that it possibly could. I I, I feel like putting my hands up and saying, can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you know, no matter what your motivation is for for being a, a prepper, a survivalist, a homesteader, uh, no matter what your motivation is, really, there's something to be said for getting your food directly from its source, directly from a small independent person and your neighbor. Yeah, and that's and one of the things that we really promote here at, at We Grow Ours is the the fact that community is how we save each other. You know, this is how we feed each other. We become more unified when there's more community involvement. When you when you separate individuals and have them lead in their own lives and they're separated from their neighbors and independent of their neighbors per se, you don't have that network of trust. And it's it's a lot easier to get along with your neighbors and share, hey, I've got eggs here. Would you like some eggs? That way if you've got a rooster that mouths off at four thirty in the morning, they're a little less to less likely to call up the the old government <laughs> and get the right. rooster out of there. Yeah, and when <laughs> you know, if things happen it's nice to know that your neighbor isn't going to come knocking at your door for food because they have food. They're going to come knocking to barter with you. So let's get back into the quail that you're doing a little bit, Scott. And again, I, I want to get into that numbers. You said you raised 200 quail in your house right now? Well, we fluctuate anywhere. Um, we we normally have at least 150 quail on the property, and it'll go up to as much as about 400 quail, uh, depending on demand from customers, our family's food demand, and, uh, you know, just production of the, uh, the eggs. Uh, now, you know, if I get hungry and I want an omelet, I'm eating the eggs instead of hatching them. <laughs> so, <laughs> So how, I, I I have a quail at home as well. So when you're talking about the eggs, give us some tricks on how to break those eggs. Yeah, and, they're like and, marbles. Yeah, those things just do not break very easily. No, quail eggs are um, incredibly difficult to to crack open at home, uh, mostly because their shell is very, very thick. Uh, but even once you get through that shell, there's a membrane inside the shell that's also very thick, and it's, I mean, you, you need a knife almost to cut through that. There's a solution, a really easy solution. You can go on the Internet and pick up a pair of quail egg cutters, and they look like a pair of scissors with a big zero at one end and a triangle on the other end of the scissor, and you stick the egg into the zero. When you close it, the sharp knife of the triangle cuts the top of the egg off, and it's Absolutely seamless. It nice. is a must-have for anyone who's raising quail. Yeah, I'll I'll post a link to those in the show notes too, so people yeah. can see those. those they, they are ingenious. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think there was somebody out there that said, "That's it. I'm making a pair of scissors." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, when we first started, I didn't even know about these scissors. After you know, cracking open a dozen eggs and trying to make an omelet, and only getting two eggs in, that didn't have <laughs> shells in them. Uh, my wife almost said, that's it, uh, forget it. So we found these, and uh, it made life so much easier. Nice. I'm talking about eggs, just as a general principle, so people can get a scale on this. For for baking purposes, you'd use three quail eggs in substitution for one large chicken egg. Okay. So that can give you a rough idea as to the size of the eggs. Now, what about nutrition value? Well, quail eggs are lower in bad cholesterol, higher in good cholesterol. They're 90% or close to that, as far as, as I can tell, yolk. They are very, very tasty. Well, let's say I go and I buy some quail. I've got the cage. What what should I feed them? Well, quail are, uh, have a little bit different dietary requirements than chickens would. Uh, think of your quail as a turkey. They need uh, at least 25% protein in their feed. And if you go out to the store, turkey feed is between 25 and 30% protein. So you're saying they need over 20? What, you said 25 or over is, is ideal? It's a minimum of 25 just to survive. If they have less than that, they will go cannibalistic. Oh. Um, trying to get 
trying to get protein from other birds. Uh, their ideal target range is 30% uh, percent protein. If you can find feed out there that is higher than 30% percent protein, that is your best chance of getting bigger birds. Feed them the, the higher percent protein all the way through. But anything over 27% and they will be perfectly happy. So that's interesting you brought that up. We uh, Last week we had on our show Carl from the biopod.com, and this guy has invented a way to harvest black soldier fly larvae, and I can't remember right now, but I believe it's 40 to 60% protein in these black soldier yeah, flies. Yeah, depending on what you're feeding the black soldier flies, kind of changes the protein levels, but have you uh, have you thought about feeding your quail the black soldier flies? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> we feed our quail uh, organic feed because we want non-or uh, non-GMO quail. So, non-organic feed typically is made with genetically modified corn, soybean, and uh, wheat or whey or whatever else they can find to bump the protein level up. Yeah. So the the organic feed that you can find out there generally is in about the 20 percent protein range, which is not enough for quail. So we do have to substitute or supplement protein into their feed, and insects are an excellent way of doing it. We started off using uh, dried millworms that we raised ourselves or bought on the Internet that were organically produced. Black soldier flies have taken over. Those things are amazing. So you just kind of blend that in with your food. Uh, quail in nature will eat insects, so they absolutely go nuts for them. It's like candy to them. Nice. They absolutely love those little guys. You know, it actually brings up next weekend or next week on the episode four, I think it's going to be, we're having some guests from Tiny Farms. And Tiny Farms is insect farms. They're not only going to show us and talk about raising insects for our livestock, but raising insects for human consumption to up our protein levels. So I'm ecstatic and excited about that one. And I think it'll go really well with the whole food and the quails because we can go non-GMO, we can go organic, and we can supplement the insects that we also raise ourselves off of other organic matter in our gardens and our fish ponds and wherever else we get our wastes and meats from and and really make this a, a homestead and a, an integrated system like we like to talk about. Yeah, I got to say I'm a little bit skeptical though about uh, raising bugs for human consumption. I'll feed it to something else and eat the, eat the something else that's eating them because – I'm not going to crunch on a cricket. Uh -huh. I love it. I love the idea. I can't wait to get some. I want to try some crickets. Uh... Well done. That's why you're creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you're raising bugs and you're raising the black soldier flies and you've got these quail. And if I heard right, you had, you have at one point had 200 to 300 quail inside your house. Now, can I just take a moment and say, you've got to have the coolest wife around because <laughs> – my wife, if I said, oh, yeah, I want to raise quail, honey, I need a bedroom, she'd be like, uh-uh. <laughs> you know, my my wife is the most amazing person on the planet. You know what she asked for for Christmas? Oh, let's hear she it. Asked, she asked for a large quail egg incubator and a large quail brooder. So I'm making one for her since I couldn't find one out there that was uh, – that was designed for quail. So. Nice, nice. <laughs> so that, that's what she asked for for Christmas. So, I mean, she's an amazing, amazing person. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be doing this. So uh, su supportiveness. I mean, that you've got to get the whole family involved in this thing. You, you have a son too, right, Scott? Yeah, he's, he's going to be 15 next month. He, uh, at first, was very skeptical. <laughs> really, 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 really hesitant. He thought the quail were the cutest little things in the world and the idea of eating him kind of grossed him out. Over the the past year and a half, two years, his attitude's changed a little bit. You know, he's grown a little bit older. He's tried eating the quail in different uh, dishes, you know, prepared several different ways. One of his favorite foods right now is quail eggs, deep fried in buffalo sauce. And uh, he just absolutely loves those. All right, my stomach just jumped at the microphone when you said that. Mm. That sounds delicious. Yeah, it does. Yeah, oh. yeah I mean... Most people discard the quail eggs because there's not, you know, in their opinion, there's not a ton of meat on it. But historically, chicken wings were discarded too because there wasn't a ton of meat on it. 
So if you treat them the same way, it tastes awesome. Plus, there's only one bone that runs right through the middle of a quail leg and, uh, and thigh. So it's much easier to get all that meat off. Yum. Nice. So I got to ask, he was he didn't want to eat them because they were cute? and Yeah, definitely he changed, the cute factor. It, he changed his mind, though, after you started butchering rabbits. <laughs> okay, quail are ugly. <laughs> we can eat the rabbits. We can eat the quail. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've uh, we've butchered a large number of animals. I will say that, uh, as it is right now, rabbit is his least favorite to get processed. <laughs> quail are really nice. You can once you get good at it, you can process a quail well easy under a minute. Yeah, start to finish. So, so I mean, they're super fast to process. How many do you process a week? To What does a meal consist of as far as number of quails? We're talking about having 200 quails at your house or up to. Um, so what does that equate to in the amount of food that you guys are eating and the amount of quail? Do you have it every night? Is this a twice a, uh, you know, for a family of three, what is that number and what are you comfortable doing? Well, once again, it just depends on how often you want to eat chicken every single night and how many different ways you can think of preparing it. Because, you know, essentially, that's what we're talking about. You substitute the quail for the chicken in whatever recipe you're using. For us, if we're eating the quail straight up as a main course meal, we generally prepare two to three quail per person. Now, if you were going by the food guidelines and only eating the recommended protein that you're supposed to, it's actually just about perfect for one quail. You, know, wow. you need four to eight ounces of protein every meal. So that's just about what one quail is. But we're American. We like our protein. We eat a ton of them. America. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. But once again, it also depends on what recipe you're doing. If I'm doing fried rice, you know, I'll throw probably two quail in for fried, fried rice for eight people. And that's more than enough quail to season that. Uh, if I'm doing uh, chicken noodle soup, I'll probably put three or four quail in that. But if I'm doing, you know, cold quail barbecue smoked sandwiches, oh. yeah, we're awesome. probably going to eat, you know, each person's probably going to eat four or five quail. Scott, so. stop it. I'm <laughs> drooling on the microphone. You're doing, you're doing horrible things to me. <laughs> Horribly good. Yes, exactly. Oh well, that is awesome. I I wish that I had the setup to uh, to raise quail in my backyard. Right now, I've been focusing on rabbits, but uh, I think one of these cages that I that I build, I'm gonna I'm gonna set up and start raising my own back there. Uh, I uh, for those that don't know, I, I've actually been buying a lot of quail from Scott and then selling them in the in the East Valley. That way, we can kind of spread his quail out and around because he's just got the best. Uh, He's got the best quail in town. He raises the non the non GMO. I just think that uh, it's a great thing that you're doing, man. Yeah, I do. I, I actually have uh, my quail from Scott as well. Scott, my quail, I'm I'm loving them. I, I will ask you for a couple of tips for people starting out, and I know I have a question for you as well. So I'm going to start with my question, and maybe we can get some tips from you. Um, okay. I have a problem with my quail attacking each other. And it seems that if I put any, I have a male and female and I have a little three part cage, I have a male and female in there. They do wonderful. It's when I try to introduce new quail that are in the six to seven week range. It seems the male just attacks the heck out of them. And a lot of times I have to pull them back out because I don't want to lose them. Yes. Uh, quail are very territorial. They do not like new quail being introduced into their environment, but it is the men who do this, the attacking. The females, they don't care who comes and goes into their property. So if you're having a problem introducing new quail into a enclosed tight environment, like your three small three compartment cage that you're talking about, then what you might want to think about doing is moving all the birds to a new compartment because then it's new for everyone. It's not a single person's domicile. Mixing up the birds, taking the male out, throwing them with a different female, and then introducing your your new birds and a new male into that female's cage. Something along those lines is what I'd recommend in that case. Uh, one thing you do have to be very careful with is that you don't have too many males for your females. You want a ratio of three to five females for every male. 
And if they're in a really tight environment, you really don't want multiple males in the same cage together normally because uh, males, like I said, get very territorial. And they protect their mate. I've got three males, one in each section of the cage, but it seems like introducing the new ones is, is the – I'm going to try moving them all. I think that's a really good idea. So what other tips do you have for somebody getting started and – you know, that wants to do quail, wants to eat quail, raise them for eggs, however they want to do it. What's your tip? Tell us what we need to do. Well, my tip would be to start with chicks. Newborn chicks are uh, incredibly inexpensive. And, you know, you don't have to wait a very long time for them to start laying. We're talking just a couple of weeks. So uh, if you want fully adult, mature quail, normally you're going to pay almost three times more than you will for the chicks. So, first thing I would say is start with some chicks. Uh, you want to keep the chicks in a nice, warm environment. And I say warm, uh, it depends on how old they are, but uh, anywhere from 90 degrees down to 75 degrees until they get uh, old enough. At about three and a half weeks old, they'll be able to be moved outside with, uh, you know, protection. They don't, they don't need a heat lamp or anything like that. But you do want to keep them away from drafts. Uh, you want to keep them out of direct sunlight. You don't want to cook your, your birds either. Um, Not before they have barbecue to, anyways. This is very true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, You want to keep them uh, dry, uh, just like with uh, with rabbits. You know, they can handle the cold really, really well. It's the, uh, the heat or being wet or being wet with breezes that, that really affects them. All right, Scott, I know you're in the west part of Phoenix, but are, do you sell any products other than quail? And how do we get a hold of you if, if anybody listening in Phoenix and Arizona or anywhere else in the country is interested in quail? Uh, what's your contact info? How can we get a, reach out to you? Well, currently right now, I am located in the West Valley of, uh, of Phoenix in one of the suburbs. I'm in the city of Avondale, which is... Uh, pretty small. People know where Phoenix International Raceway is. I'm right down the road from them. But I am, like I said, I'm in a very small housing development here. So I'm not one of the guys who owns the 100 acres out there by the racetrack. <laughs> um, as far as getting in contact with me, the best way to get in contact with me is, is via Facebook. Now, you do not need a Facebook account to view my Facebook page. And the Facebook page is the Yarish Homestead. So it's uh, www facebook.com slash the Yarsh Homestead. That's the best way of getting a hold of me. I do advertise quell brooder kits. A brooder is the little house that you keep the chicks in until they are old enough to be moved outside. Those are called brooders, for those of you who don't know. And I sell those uh, when I have extras available. I sell them on Craigslist in the Phoenix area. I also sell my chicks on Craigslist, or you can contact me via the Facebook page, and I will gladly give out information. Um, the Facebook page is full of all kinds of really cool tips. I try to keep them up to date, so, you know, I tell people, you know, when the sunlight starts to go down, hey, put a timer on your birds if you want them to keep playing so that they have plenty of light. If it gets too cold, I say, hey, you know, we expect some, some wind tonight. Make sure your birds are protected. That sort of stuff is what I throw up on Facebook. As well as some really great quail recipes. Cool. All right. I like recipes. I will uh, also link to your Facebook page from our show notes on the We Grow Ours website. Now, Scott, you're also going to be teaching at the Homesteading Conference April 5th and 6th in Chandler. Is that correct? That is correct. I will be doing a class on quail taking you all the way through every step you need to know. I will be starting at Chicks, working my way up through adults, and then uh, talk about uh, incubating, because that is, once again, the way that I suggest that people get into quail, starting with Chicks. We will talk about what to feed them, how to house them, how to get them to lay good, how to, uh, how to get a, your birds to be a bigger size just through selective feeding and selective breeding. We will also talk about some little hints and tips that I found over the years and maybe even a couple of recipes. Uh, pickled nice. quail eggs are amazing. Pickled quail eggs. I've done it. 
I've, I've done that recipe. In fact, I got it from Scott. They were phenomenal. Really? And I added the jalapenos and habaneros from my aquaponics system because, you know, I have that whole raft, that whole bed, uh -huh. uh, media bed for growing hot peppers for hot sauce. Scott, thank you for that. That idea it is phenomenal. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, Super Bowl is coming up real soon. You have plenty of time to get your uh, your colleagues pickled. And, uh, you know, the great thing is they're bite sizes. Pop, in, pop them in your mouth. You don't have to worry about it. Fun it's size. It's kind of like a deviled egg with just the entire egg. Really? Yeah, because <laughs> I kind of sweet pickle. It's like a deviled egg, except you like, just Do you, do you leave the around. shell on them? Or what? No, 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 no. You hard boil them, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today, and I really look forward to your class coming up in uh, in April, that 5th and the 6th. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to be processing a quail there, too, to just show the people that's how right. easy it is. On Sunday, you're doing the processing class. Yeah. We're going to do rabbit, quail. We might bring a fish out. I don't know. We'll have to get our murder on in front of everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Scott, thank you so much for joining us. I'll get all your information posted so people can find you on Facebook, and I really appreciate all the time. Oh, I appreciate what you guys are doing. It's a great connection for people who are uh, who are looking to just take their their food into their own hands and and become self sufficient for whatever reason they have. You guys are a great source for that, and I appreciate what you're doing. Thanks, well, thanks, Scott. All right, we want to thank Scott for coming on and joining us this week at We Grow Ours. All right, so this week's random plug of the week is Mesa Feed Barn. Uh, these guys have been supplying me with rabbit feed for a long time. They've got uh, my favorite brand of rabbit pellets, which is Star Milling, and uh, I've been getting it there. It's a 16% protein pellet. Uh, it's 3.3% fat, which is the highest fat content you can get in the valley, which is important because rabbits are a, a very lean animal. And when you're eating them, you want them to have as much fat available as possible and uh, makes them taste a little better, makes them look a little healthier and a little bit rounder. So uh, they're, it's a good brand to have. want to wrap up the show today. Again, we're going to go through all the links and look at the show notes. We want you guys to come look at the show notes on WeGrowOurs.com. You can uh, get us on iTunes. You can find us on Stitcher. We Grow Ours at We Grow Ours on Twitter, Facebook.com slash We Grow Ours. Before we wrap up, I have a rabbit question for you. All right. And I posted Fire this away. on the rabbit forum. I think there's a hostile hair rabbit forum right. on Facebook. So – one of the things I did not know this, and my niece called me the other day. She had more rabbit babies, by the way. Mm -hmm. Six weeks after the last kit, this doe had another seven, I think, or eight. Wow. So she's got seven. Six weeks later, another seven. Her other rabbit only had one, um, and he's a big one. <laughs> well, he's getting all the mama. He is, and his name is Thor. <laughs> so uh, Melissa is having a wonderful time with rabbits. She's going to be selling me the rabbits. Because she wants to kind of raise them as pets and increase her rabbitry. Mm -hmm. So she she kind of likes them as a cute and fluffy. She knows that I like them for meat. And we have an understanding we won't discuss that. <laughs> so the question that I think she brought it up to me or my, my brother-in-law did was that rabbits need to eat. We, we talk about poop a lot too. We say awesome and we talk about poop. Poop's uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, I guess rabbits need to eat their own poop. Yes. And he, my brother-in-law, is who it was, said in the cage system – that I have one of Nick's cage systems. How do they eat their own poop? So I found the answer, but I did not know that, that rabbits need to eat their own poop. So tell me, why? Rabbits need to eat not all of their poop, but there's two types of poop. There's the hard cocoa puff looking pebbles that come out. And then there's kind of a squishy greenish color, sometimes brownish color that's called the, the sesum or the cecum. I forget exactly how oh. to pronounce it, but Basically, there's two tracks that your that their manure goes through. There's the regular track for digestion, and off the main large intestine, there's another another intestine. I don't know how to say it, but that, that, that fill, works that fills up with the nutrients that weren't absorbed uh, from the the regular track, and it just slowly fills up with really fine, good nutrients as well as harboring bacteria that actually help in the digestion process. Because the, it's the flora or the, the flora and yeah, fauna. Yeah, the good bacteria. Exactly. 
And what happens is the the rabbit will eat new food and it'll go through them rather quickly. But some of the bacteria sticks around that help bro- break that food down. And then it pops populates itself in that area. And then the rabbit knows when it's going to poop out this other secum. Secum? It's spelled C-E-C-U-M. So secum. Secum. Okay, anyway. so in a cage system, you sell the the meat systems mm-hmm. for rabbits. Uh, how do you go about doing it? Because the poop in in my cage system falls to the tray, and Sorry. it actually gets automatically washed out when I spray it down. And well, actually, the rabbits will know. Sometimes they'll know. Actually, they know when they're going to poop out the the cecum. And when they do that, they'll tilt their, they'll lift a leg up and reach back there and, and clean themselves as it's coming out. Gotcha. Now, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they don't react the way they're supposed to. But if you have a board in there, something for them to lay down on, they'll usually put it on the board and then turn around and eat it. Another thing that's interesting is the baby rabbits are not born with bacteria in their digestional tract. They, uh, they need they, so they get that from their mama. Exactly. And not just, <clears throat> not just from drinking mama's milk does the bacteria pass on because it's, it's not. That's never in her mammaries. It's never in her bloodstream. It's always in the tract. So she will go into the nest box and leave cecum in there with the babies. Interesting. And they'll gnaw on it and, and they'll, they'll pick up the bacteria. So this is, this is important when you are changing food. For your rabbits, you want to make sure you've got enough of your old food stock and the new food stock to gradually increase the ratio of new to old. Very cool. And that will allow them to build up good, healthy bacteria in their system to help them process the new food. It's very important when you're when you're foraging for your bunnies right. to do that. Uh, not so much when you have commercially ready, readily available feed because they get used to one pellet and you just keep giving them that that one type of pellet gotcha well what a heck of a way to wrap up a podcast this week yeah Poop. ended on a again brown note yeah <laughs> so thank you for joining thanks for joining us on the we grow ours podcast look forward to talking with you next week next week is tiny farms Ooh, i'm ecstatically excited i can't wait to get these guys tiny on the phone farms. i hope it'll be next week we haven't gotten the interviews all quite firmed up yet but i am so excited about eating insects yeah, you're really creepy. I'm excited about raising insects for my animals, and then I am excited about eating the animals that eat the insects. Yeah, and we're going to convert you. I think these, if Dude. anybody can do it, it sounds like these guys are the open source insect farms. How awesome is that? Oh, this is going to be great. I look forward to it. I've been looking at wanting to raise like crickets and stuff to feed to my ducks, and uh, these guys have an amazing, they have an amazing setup, and uh their name's Tiny Farms. It's awesome. Reminds me of uh, what's what's the name of that show with the minions? Uh, Despicable, Despicable Me. Despicable Me. <laughs> Curse you, tiny toilet. <laughs> anyway, so join us uh, next week. Hopefully, we'll be discussing tiny farms. If not, we'll bring you another equally as interesting subject. Heck yeah! And we'll we'll see you then. That was awesome with quail. We say awesome too much on this podcast. It's awesome, man. Awesome, man. So <laughs> I'm trying to record. All right. Stop. All right. Start over. All right. Oh. <laughs> nice. Here, Scott. Yay. Woo. Sorry. Yay. Woo. Yay. Woo. That will be edited, by the way. You won't hear me saying yay, woo on the freaking podcast. <laughs> yay, woo. <laughs> woo. Oh, gosh. Uh, Plug of the week. Attention marijuana users, potheads, and stoners. We Grow Ours is not dedicated to the growing of yours, quote unquote. So please disregard any messages here. But if you want to contribute to society, start growing yours, as in your food, as in your munchies, as in just get off the weed. The opinions of Nick Klein on We Grow Ours do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Don Cupper. If you want to grow your own marijuana, feel free, as long as it's legal in your state. <laughs>